I'm so pleased to have Dr. Carter with us here tonight, and I'm even more pleased and honored to have the opportunity to introduce him to all of you. I believe you will find your lives changed for the better by being here tonight. I'd like to focus on some of the moments of monumental change in Dr. Carter's life. As a young college student, Eric was on a path to a prestigious business career when he became friends with an individual with an intellectual disability, changing his life forever. At this same time, Eric, Eric also found his calling to faith and understanding that the most powerful ministry that could happen is simply being involved in people's lives. So he left Emory and transferred to Wheaton College where he met his lovely wife, Sharon. Eric and Sharon are the parents of three really great children who are big fans of Studio C. <laughs> Eric and Sharon started out as school teachers and eventually returned to Vanderbilt to get his doctorate in special education, <coughs> then to the Waisman Center at the University of Wisconsin-Madison as faculty. For many, that would be more than enough prestige and research for a lifetime, but Eric changed his life once more to prioritize family, going home to Vanderbilt, where he is now the Cornelius Vanderbilt Chair in Special Education. He's a member of the Kennedy Center there and um, an affiliated faculty in the Graduate Religion Department. In the midst of an ambitious and very accomplished career, Eric's true passion has been to work directly with communities to improve the lives of individuals with disabilities, especially as they transition to adult life, and especially in faith communities. He's founded several organizations to provide resources for all. He says this is because people have just been missing out by defining their community too narrowly. By the end of this evening, he hopes that you will all encounter the gifts, friendship, and faith of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, and that you will be changed as a result of those encounters as his life has been changed. Please welcome Dr. Eric Carter. Thank you, Teresa and Dave. And uh, the Hinckley family and all of you for being here tonight. It's a, a pleasure to be back at Brigham Young University and to be in the company of so many people who care deeply about the flourishing of our communities. Communities where people with and without disabilities can live and learn and love and serve and worship in the company of one another. Communities that move people who are on the margins right to the middle and make room for the stranger. And I'm especially moved by the legacy of Marjorie Pay Hinckley who is so invested in flourishing of marriages and families and ultimately of communities. And I'm so grateful for those of you who are continuing that investment and committed to sustaining that work. I wanna to speak tonight on the topic of belonging and highlight some of what we're learning through our research uh, with young people with disabilities and their families about what it means to be a community marked by belonging. Now these are for members of our community who sometimes encounter wounding rather than welcome in our communities. Young people with labels like autism or Down syndrome or intellectual disabilities. Uh, but my sense is, even though I'm gonna focus on those young people, that this is really a conversation tonight about what it means to foster belonging for anyone. And so I challenge you to think about how the ideas that I'll share today might be expressed within the communities that matter most to each of you. I want to start with a bit of a history a lesson to give some context for the discussion. Because the experiences and the outcomes that we've been pursuing for young people with disabilities over the years have changed dramatically over the last few decades, particularly in my own field of special education. At the time that I was born in 1973, <coughs> uh, most individuals with developmental disabilities found themselves entirely excluded from public education and so many community opportunities. And then as we sought to fought for early legislative and policy changes, we found some initial successes in the 70s and after that. And those services began to come to people with disabilities, but those opportunities were largely provided in separate or segregated contexts, uh, apart entirely from anyone else who didn't have a similar label as they did. Then throughout the 80s and the 1990s, our focus was primarily on promoting integration into the same schools that young people would have attended if they didn't have a disability. We sometimes called this mainstreaming. This often meant a special education classroom that was near, but not really among the other kids in that particular school. And most recently, we've been captivated by efforts to support inclusion, inclusion in the same classes and clubs and cafeterias and all the places where life happens in a school, but also inclusion in our workplaces and in our neighborhoods. 
I share this series of images for a few reasons. One is because it's not really just a history lesson. It's actually almost a living history museum in a sense, because you can travel all across our country, all across any state, and still see examples of all of these depictions for people with disabilities. And second, I think it's also a way of thinking about our progression within our faith communities, that we also have moved along this continuum from inclusion to segregation to integration and inclusion. But the main thing I want to point out is that I don't think we've quite arrived in what we're pursuing uh, of what matters most in all, of all. Because as I talk to young people with disabilities and their families, they want to be much more than integrated. They want to be much more than just included. They want to belong. We want to experience belonging. And that's what I'm going to focus on tonight. That's our conversation, belonging. And I wonder, have you ever thought about what it is that makes you feel like you really belong somewhere? About the things that make you feel like you're really part of a community? And if you took just a minute and reflected on the communities that you're part of, what would you point to that tells you that you really belong there? It's not always an easy question to answer. Uh, we affirm very quickly the importance of belonging in our own lives, but it's sometimes hard to tell what is it that makes us feel that way. But it's also one of those things that when you don't belong, you sure feel that. We know it by its absence. We know it when it's missing in our lives. So what might be some markers of belonging in our lives, and particularly within a community of faith, which is where I'll place my accent tonight? That's a question that cuts across so much of the work that I've been involved with over the last 20 years. As we strive for belonging in our schools, or belonging in our workplaces, or belonging in our neighborhoods, what will tell us that we've arrived? And so tonight I want to share some of the answers that have emerged from our multi-year research project that focused on belonging in faith communities. Because we listened to the stories and we studied the experiences of nearly 500 young people with intellectual and developmental disabilities and their families about their experiences in their congregations. And so much of what they shared with us kept circling back to the attitudes and the actions and the experiences led to their belonging. And amidst the patterns of all those stories, because research is listening to patterns in stories, 10 dimensions of belonging emerged. And here's what we heard from these families. They told us that belonging was felt when they were present, when they were invited, when they were welcomed, when they were uh, known, when they were accepted, when they were supported, when they were cared for, when they were befriended, when they were needed, and when they were loved. And I suspect you could probably add your own dimensions to this list. It's not exhaustive, and no, they may not even be universally affirmed by everyone in this room. But I want to spend my night walking through each of these 10 dimensions and talking about why they matter so much for individuals with disabilities and their families, and what can we do as communities to put pieces of people in a position to experience all of these things. As I do that, I want to get, sort of be a little provocative and remind or highlight a couple key points. The first is that belonging is not about location. It's not about where people are. It's much more about posture than it is place, and you'll see that emerge. And the second is that we foster belonging not through programs, but through relationships. That's how belonging comes to pass. And the third thing I hope you'll leave with also is that these 10 dimensions of belonging require ordinary gestures, not extraordinary responses by us. These are well within our capacity to do as the church, as uh, uh, people who live in our communities. So as I'm walking through this, you might be thinking about in the communities that I care about, uh, what are we doing really well right now in each of those 10 areas? What could we be doing more of or better or entirely differently? And what might be some of our next steps as we begin to move towards deeper community in these areas? So let me walk through those 10 dimensions and let me start with presence. Because belonging always begins with presence. You cannot have a presence in a community if you are not actually present. And yet in so many of our communities, the primary barrier to belonging is simply the absence of people with disabilities from worship, from learning, from service, from social activities, from all the things that make up congregational life. And it's hard to feel like you're part of a community from the outside. Now, sometimes I encounter a bit of surprise when I'm asking congregations to reflect on the presence of people with disabilities in their community. Oh, we just don't have anyone here, they might say in response, or we just don't know if really many people with disabilities actually live in our area. Uh, and then they'll pause for a minute and say, uh, of course, we would certainly be welcoming if there were and they, they arrived at our congregation. 
And you could pause on that kind of response. It's an interesting one. Um, it's sort of a more subtle version of that statement. We definitely would build a ramp if there was actually anyone here who needed a ramp. So we haven't bothered to build one. And you start to see sort of that connection. But our communities are, of course, filled with people with disabilities. It's a natural part of the human condition. That's an empirical point and also a theological point. There are 60 million Americans with disabilities. That's about 19% of any community. It cuts across ge geographic uh, areas. It cuts across every demographic group, race, ethnicity, economic status, geographic locale. And so you can begin to think about what is one-fifth of the community that I live in, of Heber City, of Ogden, of Perry, of Wellsville, what's one-fifth of my community? But here we are in Provo, right? We are here, right? Okay, I just want to make sure you're, are you here too, right? <laughs> and if we did the math here, here's what we'd find. There's about 526,000 people living in the Provo or a metropolitan area. I know this because we came through rush hour traffic, so we're, we can <laughs> confirm that. What does that mean? That means there's about 15,000 uh, children and adults with intellectual disability and autism who live in this community alone, about 3% of the community, and about 100,000 people with disabilities living just in this area alone. Over half of all people over 65 have a disability, and so when we hear that scriptural question, who's my neighbor, it includes people with disabilities. Now, none of you came here to do math tonight, I'm fairly sure, so those numbers often seem kind of abstract, so I thought I'd do something that seems a little bit more tangible. I was going to take all of you outside and that we could walk through the neighborhoods that surround this particular campus, but since it's nighttime and we couldn't do that, I hired a satellite to take some images. We're right down there, but if you were looking over this campus and you just went off to the side to this particular neighborhood and uh, take, took a look at that, and we were to leave here together and stroll through that particular neighborhood and start knocking on doors, what we would find is that one out of every three households that we knocked on would include a family that had a member with a disability. It would look like this, every yellow dot being a family impacted by disability. That changes it from a, a mathematical proportion to something that experiences in every community, and we could repeat this all across. If this is your neighborhood and you see your house, I didn't actually go to every door. I'm just <laughs> using this for illustration purposes. I park on presence because most available data that we've collected and others tells us that people with developmental disabilities find themselves on the outskirts of our communities. That ministry apart from people with disabilities is often the most dominant ministry model in congregations across the country. Consider just a few sampling of statistics that we've collected in our uh, particular studies. More than half, uh, or less than half of, I'm sorry, Almost half of adults with intellectual disabilities who are supported on our state service systems are not involved in any kind of congregation at all. More than half of parents of kids with disabilities, 56%, tell us that they've kept their child with a disability from home from participating in a religious activity because there was no support provided. We've learned that nearly two-thirds of teenagers are not involved in any kind of youth programming or teen groups uh, within their local congregation. And less than one out of five uh, congregations are said to support children with developmental disabilities within their religious education programs, or to host support groups for families, or to provide respite opportunities. What's standing in the way of people becoming present in, their, in our communities, if they're present in our communities? Is it barriers of awareness or barriers of attitude, uh, maybe barriers of access? Those have abounded. Certainly, if we look back in history, barriers of architecture were one of the major issues that kept people from being present in a community. Uh, I collect photos of, uh, well, actually, I'll come back to that. I, I want to park on presence here um, for, for all of those reasons, but I think that leads to the second myth. Someone might say, well, it's maybe just that faith isn't an important part of the lives of people with disabilities. You all should be shouting me down at this point, because you know absolutely that's not the case. Uh, the presence of a disability is not at all a reliable predictor of the importance of people's faith in their lives or in the lives of their families. And while you don't need a study to prove that point, I have brought you a study to prove that point. I'll illustrate this in a way only a researcher would think is effective by showing you a graph. 
But in a national study that's done of a random sample of adults with disabilities and adults without disabilities, there's simply no difference in the importance of faith that people attribute their lives. 87% of people with disabilities, 84% of people with dis without disabilities. You don't have to be a statistician to say those really aren't different. So it's not in the importance of people's faith. But when you look in those same series of surveys that have been carried out by the National Organization on Disability, and you look at participation of people with and without disabilities, you see a very different portrait. Nationally, in the, across the United States, about 57% of people without disability attend worship services at least once a month. Not a very high bar for participation. But only 43% of people with disabilities do that. And you anchor that up into the importance of their faith, and you start to see some gaps. You see a gap between people with and without disabilities who, who are a part of a faith community, but most important, you see a gap between people whose faith is an important part of their life and there's no congregational community of which they can be part. So there's an opportunity to address that particular gap. So here again, what's standing in the way of that? Is it, is it awareness? Is it attitude? Uh, or is it architecture? Sometimes historically it has been architecture. This is a picture that I used to claim was the most inaccessible church in the world. It's built into the side of a mountain in Germany. Um, and then I shared that at a conference maybe 10 years ago and people started sending me pictures of other churches that were way more inaccessible <laughs> than that. This one in Italy that has taken inaccessibility to new heights. And then someone sent this one, which is in Eastern Europe. It's actually a monastery, but you get the point, right? And these pictures always get a chuckle. They did here. But don't subtle or barrier send that same message. What do our buildings communicate about our theology uh, in our churches, in our schools, wherever we gather. What does that one step say? That pulpit someone can't get to, a classroom that's inaccessible, a curriculum kids can't access. Does where and how we choose to gather say something about how we view our community? And as Teresa said, are we defining our communities too narrowly, even if inadvertently? So accessibility has to be a fundamental commitment as we think about making sure presence uh, exists for people with disabilities. If not by legal mandate, simply because it's, it's essential to do. And for those of you who are familiar with the concept of universal design, uh, you'll immediately see the connection here. Universal design simply means that we build our buildings as if anyone in the community might enter and that's how we want to think about the places that we gather. We so often misidentify the real sources of the barriers and the call to be out front of society, not following society into areas of accessibility. I love this quote. If shut-ins can go to Walmart but not your church, they're shut out, they're not shut in. When we're thinking about accessibility issues. So those of you who are interested in learning more about how can you sort of do an accessibility audit, there are resources that I can point you to in those areas. But my point in all that is presence becomes our baseline for belonging. It's not our stopping point. It's not just merely our people there. There's much more to think about, about when it comes to belonging. So you might reflect on, are people with disabilities present in our congregation? Um, and if so, uh, let's celebrate that and make sure we, we, we continue on that path. If not, what could we do in better or differently or more of that opens our doors a bit wider to this segment of our community? In some communities, this leads to the second dimension of belonging. Increasing that presence means extending new invitations. That was the second dimension of belonging that we heard from these families. And for many of these families, belonging didn't begin with a general invitation, but a personal invitation. When we're not intentional about personally reaching into our communities, we end up inadvertently leaving people out. As one pastor said, it's not that we deliberately excluded people, with disabilities. In fact, we weren't deliberate at all, and that was the problem. Lots of congregations proclaim that they're welcoming on their website, in their church signs, their outreach materials, and while that's worthwhile to do, um, it's not sufficient. We presume that that's enough. Everyone is welcome, but an announcement communicates something very different than an invitation. That's what my point is. We should announce that we're welcoming, but we should then personally communicate to families that are questioning whether you really mean me. An invitation is personal, an announcement's not. An invitation means I'm thinking about you. An announcement leaves open that possibility of an asterisk or an exception or a footnote or that question mark on is everybody really welcome. 
And there have been lots of asterisks in the stories of families when they talk about their congregations. Uh, those warm promises of reception have not always been experienced. In one of our studies that we completed a few years ago of about 400 families, we learned that one out of three parents who had a son or daughter with an intellectual developmental disability had left their congregation because their son or daughter wasn't welcomed. Those are the families needs, who need some assurance that this place will be different, that that proclamation of everyone is welcome really penetrates our practices. And it's not just aspirational, it's actually what we live out. And I think that's why I'm emphasizing what the families are telling us. It's that personal invitation that we want you to be part of this community. Now don't get me wrong, the imagery and the language and the messages that we use to describe our communities can cue families to thinking about that we have them in mind. And there are symbols and other things that you could put in your materials that say we're thinking about you, that when you arrive, the supports will be in place. But we want to make sure we're doing more than that. And it's those active invitations into our community that are so powerful. 75% of people who attend a worship service for the very first time come because someone they knew invited them. So we've got some more inviting to do, I think, in this area. Which leads to the third dimension that we heard. Belonging involves being welcomed. And this isn't just about, from the family's perspective, what you say. It's rather what they feel when they're there. It's not the host who determines what's welcoming. It's the guest who determines that. And although a lot of attitudes have changed in society over the years, some of that uncertainty that people feel around people with disabilities about what to say or not to say, that also exists in our faith communities. And the thing is that uncertainty almost always leads to avoidance. And when people go unacknowledged or overlooked or ignored, they stop coming eventually. My sense is that we're so often prone, uh, as I look at the national landscape, to gather in ways that feel welcoming to me. Um, not as much uh, to make sure we're gathering in ways that are welcoming in sense to the stranger. We don't want to be that particular church. Um, so what does hospitality look like? It's greeting new families when they arrive. It's introducing them to others, drawing them into con conversations, inviting them to other church events, involving them in your small group, and noticing when they're not there and following up to find out why. Those are ordinary actions that sent a powerful message to families that we talked to that says we felt like we were wanted. The principal requirement here around welcome is not that you're an expert in disability. You don't even have to have any experience in this area. And it's not work that we should delegate to a hospitality committee. It's our charge for every one of us to be welcoming. There are times when it's helpful for uh, folks who are in uh, leadership or other kinds of roles in a congregation to maybe have some more confidence in extending that welcome by having some guidance on etiquette or people first language, what to say, or uh, to know about the available congregation resources that you have to offer. So when a family comes that has a child with complex communication challenges or an intellectual disability or just who behaves in unfamiliar ways, you're ready to welcome them and provide them information that communicates. We're glad you're here. We've been hoping you come and here's how we can support you to be part of this place. That's the welcome families we're talking about. And then they said as we move from just that welcome, a fourth aspect of belonging was to become known. As Christians, we're called to welcome the stranger, but the stranger's not supposed to remain a stranger for very long, right? And within faith communities, I think people with developmental disabilities are particularly at risk of being known about, but not always personally known. And that's different from just being welcomed. Now, these families talked about whether their kids are known and whether they're known as family as being an important aspect of belonging. But that's not really what they meant by to be known. They really parked on that mattering how they are known and how their kids are known, not just whether. And what they meant by that is that are kids known by their names, not by their labels? And are they known by the strengths and gifts they bring to this community, not only by the deficits and the challenges that they experience? That's a different way of coming to know people with developmental disabilities. Some of you may be in professions uh, working within our disability service systems. These are systems that use a lot of diagnostic labels. We define uh, people in terms like you see on the screen. Um, those labels that we use so often depict people in terms of what they cannot do or what they struggle to do. I don't want you to remember what you're seeing on the screen. I'm just putting this up because this is the definitions of those particular disabilities. 
Now, what an odd way to introduce people into community if this is your introduction, if you think about that. So if you're a congregation that's considering the question, how do we welcome people with autism? Or a youth program that's saying, how do we weave a young person with a significant intellectual disability into our youth programming? And all you have is an impression of this and these labels. That's a hard introduction. And I doubt very much there's a place for that kind of labeling actually in our faith communities. So what's a different way? What if we made at least as much investment in coming to see young people in terms of their strengths and their gifts and their positive qualities, the things that they bring to relationships and to our communities, those things that make them indispensable? Can we think about young people with intellectual and developmental disabilities as first and foremost having strengths and gifts that we need to receive? The answer there should be a loud amen, of course. Because when we talked with families, 500 families, in a study about the strengths of their children with disabilities, we gave them a scale that focused on their positive traits of their son or daughter, things about the extent to which their son or daughter exhibited kindness and gratitude and courage and empathy and optimism and forgiveness. And if you don't know, if you possess those things, I can administer the scale to you at the reception if you want, but it's a great scale. And what parents told us provides such a powerful counterpoint to those labels that you just saw. Because this is what those 500 parents of adolescents with developmental disabilities said. 93% of them said, my son or daughter is happy. 86%, it's the blue bar you should attend to, said they, their child enjoyed life and is thankful for life's simple pleasures. 86% said, my child has a great sense of humor. Uh, my child is thoughtful and helpful to others and demonstrates care for others around them. My son or daughter is bothered or concerned or upset when someone else is distressed stressed or uncomfortable. My child's courageous. My child bounces back easily. My child doesn't retaliate or get back at others who have hurt them. And well, remember, these were adolescents. Only half of parents said my child doesn't lose their temper. So they are adolescents. <laughs> right. But can we find a place for those strengths in our congregations, in our communities? How many faith communities would love to be a place and could find a place for someone who's known for their gratitude and their empathy and their kindness? How many people would love to develop a friendship with someone who's known for being funny and happy and thoughtful? How many workplaces would love to hire people who are known for their persistence and their joy and their kindness? How many of us would love to see a congregation filled with people with these qualities? So that leads us back to some new invitations that we could extend. But that's a different way to see young people with disabilities. And that's what we heard from the families is see us different, see our kids in a different light. And the church of all places can be a place best positioned to do just that. People feel like they belong when they're known. Now, belonging also involves being accepted. And real acceptance comes um, from being known. Of course, that's how you come to accept someone. Not from an awareness campaign. Not from being known about, but known personally. And the families we talked about spoke about their child being welcomed without condition, treated like family, embraced for all they were. And while attitudes have changed dramatically over the last 40 or 50 years, that acceptance can't always be presumed. These data that we collected from parents who had been part of congregations at some point are heartbreaking because what we learned when we asked these parents to share their perspectives on the extent to which their current congregation was accepting of their son or daughter with disabilities, only a little more than half strongly agreed that clergy and congregational leaders accepted their child, and slightly less than half strongly agreed that other congregation members accepted their child. It's sort of the part hidden in the dark that you don't see, that we wonder how do we raise that acceptance for uh, people who are often strangers. I put on your screen some examples of the sorts of statements that we hear over the years that reveal something about our attitudes related to people with disabilities. Um, these are uh, uh, becoming less common, but are still variations that I hear over the years. Um, it seems like a lot of energy and effort when we can't really be sure that Louise will actually get anything out of being in Sunday school with the other children. We have a special class for children just like your son or daughter, and on and on. Churches often undertake formal awareness activities, a disability or inclusion awareness kind of Sunday, curricular units and kind of religious education programs as formal ways of fostering acceptance. And when you do these well, they can be such an important part of the portfolio of things we do 
to create acceptance in our community. But I want to emphasize what we heard from families. It's personal involvement in their lives and their kids' lives that is a much more promising way of changing perspectives. We've learned in lots of areas of research about the power of personal contact when it comes to changing attitudes regarding to anyone who's the other in our particular community. Not awareness campaigns about them, but personal interactions with them. And we have to sometimes trip people, get them to stumble into those experiences for those attitudes to change. But since I'm at a university where lots of people have gone into ministry and leadership roles, let me emphasize that what's communicated from leadership, from the pulpit, matters immensely when it comes to attitudes. It's that clergy who's unfazed when someone uh, answers aloud their rhetorical questions in the middle of a sermon, and they're okay with that who designates the entire church a no-shush zone, who instead of asking someone who makes a little noise to go to the cry room, says anyone who can only worship in total silence should go to the cry room. And those of us who are okay with a little noise, I know these are provocative, but who recognizes that passing a quiz on the sermon is not the gateway to coming back next week, but who's willing to do things a little bit differently if it brings people into community. And we've done a national study on how theological schools are addressing the preparation of future ministry leaders. And there's more work that we have to do there as well. Which takes us to the sixth piece, uh, being supported. The individuals that I'm talking about need support to be part of our faith communities, to be part of our workplaces and elsewhere. And sometimes that support has to be marked by more individualization, more intentionality. And it has to often be a bit more intensive. And so we have to think about what supports are we going to provide if we want to be that sort of community. But this is not a place to make presumptions. It's a place to invite input. We found that less than half of parents that we talked to in our studies have ever been asked about the best way to include their son or daughter in religious education activities. So that might just be a starting point. Ask good questions. I don't know. I'm going to put it back up. I saw someone get frustrated that the, there you go. Oops. Got it? Okay. <laughs> so ask good questions. Uh, and I don't know what the responses will be because they're, we can't presume what those responses are. These are examples of the kinds of things that you might ask of families as they arrive. Um, how, what do, should we know about your son or daughter? What are her strengths and gifts, her passions, the things she shines at, the things people compliment her on? Uh, and there are a whole host of questions. But what could we do to make our children's program the most exciting time of the week for your son or daughter? Those are questions that allow families to say, here's the things that might be helpful. And you can say, you know what? We're going to do our best. We may not get it right. We may be not be able to do all these things, but we're committed to you and your family, and we'll do our best there. So I don't know what families will say, but I can tell you in our studies of families where we did a survey recently of 500 parents of kids with developmental disabilities, we asked them what kinds of supports would be helpful from your local congregation. And here's what they said. The blue bar is the percentage of parents who said that would be somewhat to very helpful in uh, my child being part of this faith community. Disability awareness efforts in our local congregation. Just something that communicates those importance of those positive attitudes. Resources for families who are often struggling to navigate service systems and new diagnoses, pointing them to resources beyond our congregation as well. A person in the congregation who can come alongside the family, ask those questions I talk about, and then do the asking on behalf of the families. So families who are having to be in advocate roles all week long in schools and medical places and elsewhere don't have to be the advocates on Sunday. Someone else can do that asking with them. Spiritual counseling from a congregational leader, a support group for parents, respite, some chance to go on a date, to have a, do some shopping, to take a nap, to go away for a night, it may be the only time in the year they're able to do that when a, when a congregation does a respite for their son or daughter. Modifications to religious education programs, an intentional plan for how we're supporting their son or daughter in all we do in a congregation and going all the way down. It's interesting, the least common thing that was named was an accessible congregation. And I want to be really careful, don't read that as, oh, we don't have to be accessible in that sense. I think this is because a lot of, for the, a lot of these families, their children didn't have mobility and impairments and physical disabilities. If you do, that is the most important issue, for example. So I want to be careful. The numbers I just put up on your screen are also an opportunity for movement because these percentages are the percentages of congregations that are reported to actually provide each of those different supports. So the opportunity 
to really make some movements lies in the gap between those numbers. 70% of families say disability awareness would be such a powerful thing in our congregation. 10% of congregations are reported to do that. So there's opportunities there. For those of you who want to learn more, you can read one of the articles that we buried in a journal that you're not subscribed to that costs too much to join. Or you can download a free guide that we also put up uh, on our website that walks through those 14 supports, what they look like, and how to access them. For the next 24 hours, that report will be free. And then after that, it will be free. OK, so it's always free. <laughs> Seventh, healthy faith communities are marked by care for one another. They recognize, they strive to support the spiritual needs of their families and in their congregation, but also the emotional and practical needs of their members. And that care communicates that you matter, that you belong. And in our projects, one of the things we found was that the strongest predictor of family quality of life was their connection to a faith community and a vibrant faith. The families that we spoke with highlighted the importance of the support specifically related to disability uh, that anyone would access in a congregation. That's ministry to people with disabilities, and that's an important element. Um, but there's also a no shortage of congregations that collectively could make an impact on helping people with disabilities the other six days of the week. Not just on Sunday, but the other six days when life happens as well. There are 335,000 places of worship in the United States, all faith traditions and denominations. I thought most of them were in Nashville, but uh, I realized that Provo has a number of them as well, right? <laughs> congregations on every corner, um, right? Every dot on this map is a church of some kind in our community. But think about this, the impact that collectively congregations could have on some of the outcomes. The poverty rate for people with disabilities is twice what it is for people without disabilities. The employment rate for people with intellectual disability, the young people I work with, extraordinary young people, the employment rate is 10%. The unemployment rate is 90%. Inadequate housing options abound. Twice as many people with disabilities don't have access to reliable uh, transportation. And all of those are areas that as congregations, we could do something profound about collectively or individually within our congregation. We've had a project called Putting Faith to Work where we've been supporting congregations to come alongside a transition age youth help discover their gifts and their passions and then network through their congregation and beyond to say, where in our community are those gifts exactly what is needed? And let's make that connection to the workplace. We've had nearly 60 people with disabilities who've gotten jobs by a congregation just coming around them the way they do for lots of people who are out of work, but they don't think to do it for people with disabilities because there's a service system that takes care of that. We're seeing the same pattern of things around housing options for people with disabilities, integrated housing options. There are three uh, seminaries now across the country that have established integrated housing options where seminary students, future congregation leaders, live in community with people with intellectual disabilities. What an incredible thing for people with intellectual disability who need integrated housing in their community. What an incredible impact on the future congregations of those leaders who will have lived and learned alongside people with disabilities. That's the issue of care that families were talking about. Let's think beyond the three or four hours that we might gather on a Sunday morning or however and whenever you gather for worship and think about that there's seven days in a week and how can we step into those other spaces as well. Eighth, we were made for relationships. It's another theological point and an empirical one, I think. But the companionship and the intimacy, the reciprocity, the support of friends is essential to our thriving. There's incredible work happening here at BYU of scholars who've reminded us that loneliness and isolation doesn't just hurt, it actually can kill. And um, so we have to be intentional about relationships. All of the other dimensions I've already talked about up till now can all be done at arm's length in the absence of close relationships. But belonging is deeper than that, and friendships take it even further. However, those friendships that are so fundamental to all of our flourishing are so elusive for children and adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities. In one nationally representative a study of adolescents with autism, 51% of high school age kids with autism had not been invited to any other kid's social activity, not once in the last year. And one out of every four adults with intellectual disability living in communities have no friendships or caring relationships with people other than 
core family members, and paid staff who are part of their lives. My point in all of this is that the relationship networks of people with developmental disabilities are often quite different than they might be of our own lives. If I were to ask each of you to think about all the people you know and you spend time with and start naming them and putting them on a chart, you'd put up a lot of names. You'd put up some names in this inner circle of your family members. You'd put up a bunch of names of people who are your friends and your close companions. And hopefully you'd have a pretty thick set of names in that category. You'd have some people that, eh, they're not your best friends, but you see them occasionally, you interact with them, they're acquaintances, occasionals. And then you've got people who are paid to be in your lives, right? And I put that very crudely. Your doctor, right? Your auto mechanic, your defense attorney if you're in some trouble. I don't know what your issue is. I don't know. I don't want to get into that, right? The issue that we learn as we come alongside people with developmental disabilities is not that there aren't a shortage of names that go up. Lots of names go on this chart. They just tend to go into two circles. They tend to go in that inner circle of family and a whole lot of staff that we surround people with, right? So this is a place not for force, but for finesse. Laws and mandates for access and inclusion can do lots of things. They create access, they convey rights, they can create encounters, but they have limits in what laws can do. I love this quote by Hans Reinder in his wonderful book, The Power of Inclusion and Friendships. Rights and choices can do lots of things, uh, but whatever rights and choices can do, they're not gonna make you my friend. We can't legislate friendship. We can't mandate friendship. And so here's where the opportunity comes in for all of us. And the importance of what takes place between Sundays, after the benediction, as we sometimes say. It's life lived beyond the walls of our congregations that pushes people from mere acquaintances towards close friendships. Whether that's sharing a good meal or participating in a favorite hobby or going to the mall together, watching the big game together or joining the same small group for individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities, those ordinary gestures that I just mentioned that we do all the time don't happen for them outside of the service system. And the great thing about this befriending is you don't have to have any training. You don't need a specialized degree. You don't need a PhD to do this. We know how to befriend people. And the way you do that for people with developmental disabilities is exactly the same way, which takes us to number nine. People come to feel needed when others in a congregation see them as bringing gifts and talents that benefit the entire community, uh, that are essential to the community's thriving. That's ministry by people with disabilities, not to with people with disabilities, but by people with disabilities. And it reflects a recognition that they, like everyone else, are indispensable members of the body. It's through relationships that we come to see our need for one another. And for many individuals with disabilities and families with whom we spoke in our research projects, that authentic belonging was really characterized by a real, a real reciprocity, whereby each person gives to and, and receives from that relationship. And I think more and more congregations are stepping into ministry to people with disabilities, but they struggle to see ministry by people with disabilities. They're still viewed, people with disabilities viewed as the static designated recipients of ministry or support. The roles of who's the giver, who's the receiver, who's the one who has something to uh, give, who's the one who's in need of that, the one who serves and the one who's being served remain static for so many people with disabilities. Uh, and it's absolutely true that people with disabilities have much to gain from being part of a faith community. But it's also true that our faith communities have much to gain by encountering the gifts of people with disabilities and their families. And it's when that mutuality is expressed that we start to see real deep, lasting belonging happen for families. That's why I love this church sign. It's not from a church I attend. It's actually from a congregation next door to where my uh, son goes to high school. So I pulled it up because in Nashville, they like putting up quotes on church signs. It's the thing they do there. But I love this one. I'm pretty sure they had, that they didn't mean anything related to this talk when they were putting this up. But it's a posture that I wish congregations would adopt when they think about their community, a faith community that includes people with disabilities. We need you here, ASAP. As a community, we're incomplete without the presence and participation of people with disabilities. The scripture that they're referencing, of course, 1 Corinthians 12 is up on your screen. I think when we're convinced this is true, a few things become much more likely to happen. 
If we truly believe people have gifts that we need, we no longer think of inclusion as something that's nice to pursue because it's good for someone else. We start to see it as something essential because it strengthens our community. We stop being satisfied to wait until people arrive to welcome them, and we start pursuing people who are missing from our community. We move beyond tinkering and retrofitting our programs and our facilities so that they'll work for people with disabilities, and we start designing everything we do as a faith community with people with disabilities in mind at the outset. They move from an afterthought to a forethought in that sense. Which takes us to number 10, and those of you looking at the time thought we would never get to number 10. But this is the most important, because finally there's love. And if you're worried about a social scientist uh, talking about uh, love and giving a lecture on that, never fear. Uh, I don't have to explain what love has to do with belonging. Some of you know the work of a gentleman by the name of Wolf Wolfensberger. He was a pioneer in the field of disability, responsible in many ways for closing down the institutions that uh, uh, dotted our landscape across the country. And one of the things he said uh, is he offered this reflection that healing for wounded people with disabilities begins with three messages. You are valuable, you are as valuable as any other person, and you are loved by those around us. And if any of you have read work by Henry Nouwen, he reminds us that among all of our deepest questions is that question, is there anyone who really loves me? Well, the scriptures are reminding us over and over that all we do, all we are, has to be marked by love. Service systems, and I work hard to fix our service systems and make them strong, service systems are not designed to love, but the church is. And so that means belonging, um, takes us back to where we started. It's a simple concept, and yet maybe I've made it complex and hopefully put it down into bite-sized pieces. But I think this brings us to some points of reflection. As we think about our own congregations or whatever community we're part of, the workplace we're part of, the school we work in, the neighborhood that we live in, are people with disabilities and their families, are they personally invited? Are they present in all aspects of what we do? Are they experiencing a warm welcome and reception when they arrive? Are they well known throughout our faith community, not by their labels or by the kids who are part of that class, but by their names and their gifts? Are they accepted without condition or caveat? Are they provided the support that they need to participate fully in all that we do as a gathering community? Are they receiving care in ways that enable them to flourish? Are they developing friendships that extend beyond a particular day of the week and into the community? Are they seen as needed and indispensable to the thriving of our community? And are they loved deeply and unconditionally? And while I've ordered these in a way that kind of gives you a sense that one is more important than the others, that's absolutely not the case. Um, all of these become essential components. Being present and welcomed and known is the foundation for being in a relationship with others. Um, and if we're missing any part of these, the others sort of fall flat in a sense. Uh, the other thing is that the stories, the church stories we hear of families are rarely lukewarm. And they remind us that these things don't happen automatically. They require an intentionality on our part. So that takes us to just a few final myths as I look at the time. Um, uh, I hope that what I've shared will shatter just a few remaining myths, whether they've been spoken or just implied, but they're ones I, I sense as I look at the landscape across the country in these areas. And the first, or myth three, since we've already done two, is that these dimensions of belonging seem to me to reflect ordinary needs much more than special needs universal needs rather than exceptional needs. And so often our conversations about disability ministry accentuate the new or the distinct efforts we might make as a congregation to support the presence and participation of people with disabilities. But the themes that we heard from these families and from these young people strive, to, they really strike me as relevant for supporting the belonging of anyone. Right? These belong, this conversation could have been about what does it mean to support anyone's belonging. Uh, that familiarity and I think that broad resonance reminds us that the deepest needs of people with developmental disabilities and their families aren't really special at all. They're not even exceptional. They're quite ordinary to belong, to be befriended, to be needed, and to be loved. I would show you a video if there's time. I'm going to skip it, but there's a wonderful video. It lasts a couple and a half minutes uh, of young people with Down syndrome. Actually, I'm going to show it. Okay, that's all right, <laughs> and I'll make my... 
This is a video that came out um, a couple years ago, uh, makes the point. You could have skipped everything that I said and just watched this video. It was released as part of World Down Syndrome Day a couple years ago, and it questions what we really mean when we uh, say people have special needs. It was written by some young people with Down syndrome who said, special needs? What's a special need? This would be a special need, and then they made a video about it, so I'll show it to you. People with Down syndrome have special needs. Special needs? Really? It would be special if people with Down syndrome needed to eat dinosaur eggs. That would be special. One dinosaur egg. Enjoy. Man, I think you were totally I right about Lindsay. If we need to wear a giant suit of armor, that would be special. I got a condo in Manhattan. Baby girl, what's happening? So gonna get to grab it. Go pop a phone. It would be special if we need to be massaged by a cat. Uh, uh, if we needed to be woken up by celebrity. Wakey, wakey, eggs and bakey. How are you? You may know me from Scrubs or Office Space. A few darker flakes on the rock. Platoon, Wall Street. Funny story, I, I played bed. Get out. My bed. That would be special. But what we really need is education, jobs, and opportunities. Friends and some love. Just like everybody else. Are these needs special? So the core needs are not what's different. But the supports that we have to provide to support people are different. That's what's special in this case. Second myth, or fourth myth that I've never actually heard said, never actually spoken, but it's so implied in our practice is that people need programs more than relationships. And I simply say that because our first inclination in a lot of congregations is, oh, let's start a new program for kids with autism. Let's start a new program for people with intellectual disability. And what often the inclination is, is to do this as separate, distinct, special things where people's lives don't actually encounter one another. And I'm not opposed to programs, but I am opposed to them if they don't lead to belonging and being befriended and being seen as needed by all of the community. So I think that's an element. And then the fifth myth is that fostering belonging is best left to the experts. You don't have to have special training, any advanced degree to promote meaningful inclusion in these ways. The markers that families told us about are within the capacity of any congregation reflected in this room. We we already know how to do these things for lots of people. It's about doing them for people with disabilities. And here you are. I know, okay, I get it, Eric. That sounds like something that churches really should be doing. They really should be invested in ministry that involves people with disabilities, but we're just not sensing a call on our congregation. And besides, there are other congregations that are doing that right really well. Couldn't we just refer people and have a ministry of referral, to which you should say, absolutely not, right? The myth is that our congregation is not being called to this as well. Actually, it's not written. Actually, someone else should be addressing it. But so should we. This is our call on every congregation to be that kind of community of belonging. So to close us out, some points for your reflection. How might the attitudes and the actions of congregation members or leaders in corners of our community aim towards those 10 dimensions of belonging? And what steps might you take to become known as places where all of your members are invited and present and welcomed and accepted, cared for, known, befriended, needed, and loved? Thank you. Okay, we have just a little bit of time, 10 to 15 minutes for some questions. So if you'd like to ask a question, uh, we do have some roving microphones. We'd ask you to stand and just give your name and where you're from briefly. And uh, I'll allow uh, Eric to you know, point to a few people who are raising their hands and take those questions for the next 10 to 15 minutes.
and wait till a microphone comes over. Okay, so I'm Madeline. I'm from Gilbert, Arizona. Um, I had a question. So at the beginning, you were talking about um, the steps to fully include uh, students in our education systems. Um, I was curious, as I, you know, from my education, um, what were your thoughts on the um, least restrictive environment for teaching uh, those with developmental disabilities? Right. So the idea of those you're not familiar with the least restrictive environments, the idea that people with disabilities should be able to participate in all the things that would be available to any other kid in their school, the classes and other things. Uh, unless with services and supports, they couldn't participate fully in that. And so the presumption in schools is that kids should, the first line of thinking that we should think about is the classrooms that they'd be in without if they didn't have a label. But if we can't support that without the proper services and supports, then we start to think about separate classes or resource classrooms. And that's been an important element of special education since its inception in the mid-70s. We've often interpreted that to ju as a justification for separate classes entirely. And so very few students with intellectual disabilities have had the opportunity to be included in all of those kinds of things. So the to extent to which we use that as the default, that we begin with separate and then have to have people earn their way into inclusive classrooms, is not the spirit of that law, and I, that is what makes me reluctant in that pace. But the extent to which we start off, what is everyone else doing in the school? How can we support access? And if we can't support that well, or it's not meeting their needs, then we look to other settings. That's a principle that I'm, I'm in support of. My concern is that so often we quickly jump to separate because we view their needs as separate or distinct. And the thing that we lose in that is the relationship pieces. I grew up in schools, like you all grew up going to schools, I presume, but I grew up in a school system that functionally did not include people with developmental disabilities. I never met young people with Down syndrome growing up in elementary, middle school, or high school because of that proclivity to move kids to the peripheries of the communities. The wonderful thing now is that in current schools, that's changing, that's dramatically changing, and more and more kids are growing up in this space. And frankly, it's a lot of us who didn't grow up in that context that have a more tough time with inclusion than kids in our schools right now. So, there's a question in the back. Uh, so I'm Jake Ferry. I'm from Bountiful here near Salt Lake. Uh, my question is, are universities kind of the early adopters and influencers in changing the culture to a culture of inclusion? And if it's not universities, then what groups or organizations are they? How many of you in here are parents of children with disabilities? These are the mover, these have been historically the movers and shakers, the ones who pushed for the initial laws to give kids access and were often the ones fighting most doggedly in their schools and communities for access. So that's long been a powerful piece of what's happened. And I think there has been a push at the university level of how are we training the next generation of teachers to see these as important elements of schooling, not just academic rigor, not just relevant skills, but also relationships alongside these. So we talk about the new three R's as rigor, relevance, and relationships. This will just test your age quickly. What are the old three R's? Reading, writing, and arithmetic. So that dates some of you. If you ask youth that, they'll say reduce, reuse, recycle. <laughs> but rigor, relevance, and relationships is really the academic piece. So when you start to put relationships alongside that, I think the universities can be an important place of making sure we're equipping the next generation of practitioners to have that posture and that commitment, and then carrying out the kind of research that would support those kinds of programming. I think that's been present. Um, but still, we haven't changed the lab. There's still a gap between what we're learning at the university and what plays out in practice. One of the things that has me most excited uh, is the movement nationally at higher education institutions to have uh, uh, the inc to include uh, college students with intellectual disability on their college campuses. I don't know if any of you have heard of this before, but there are 270 colleges around the country and universities that now have programs that support students with intellectual disability on the college campus to audit courses or take courses to be part of extracurriculars in campus life, to go to the big game, uh, to uh, work on campus. 
And uh, we have one of those programs called Next Steps at Vanderbilt University. We're a Research One high-ranked university, and we we have a, a space for that. The reason that excites me, back to your question, is now the 12,000 students at Vanderbilt who are going to be future corporate leaders, community leaders, and congregational leaders are getting their formative training in their profession alongside people with intellectual disabilities. And our hope is that will be a powerful way of also changing the next generation of employers and others who will hire people because they learned alongside them. So I think there's a great place for the university in that space. That's a relatively new movement. Only about 1% of campuses are doing that right now. But a great opportunity to think about what that might look like in Utah as well. Good question. I think we might have time for one more. Hi, so I am um, last semester um, I threw a dance for my high school, high school I graduated from um, for students with, uh, with a disability or a, um, a special needs or anything. And this year they said I can't do it because I'm discriminating against general ed students. So after listening to this, um, I would just like to like, hear like, maybe your thoughts about it and like, what you think and um, if that's maybe something that you would fight or you feel like you'd understand. Can you back up one quick so you said, yeah. what did you establish that they said? Could so um, I threw a dance for students with disabilities and they told me that this year that I can't do it because I'm discriminating against general ed students. Oh, interesting. Um, <laughs> this is a much longer discussion over a discussion, but I think there's a couple things, I think. I think one of the things that I, I would pursue is say, um, what do we already offer for general education students? And why is there this perceived need to set up something just for students with disabilities? It almost reveals that the students with disabilities aren't supported to access what general ed kids should teach students. So it's interesting that there may be some missed opportunities in both directions. So my inclination rather than, I'm not sure how I would I'm not a legal uh, scholar, if anyone answered my colleagues on that. But my inclination would say, what could we do to design something that would be phenomenal for all of our students to do together? That my reaction in creating this distinctive thing for students with disabilities is because presently there's not really a place for them in these other programs. So how can we make that movement together? And that'll be a win-win because now everyone's having a chance to dance together, right? Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eric Carter. And as a reminder of your visit to Brigham Young University, we would like to present you with this clock. And on the front of it, it says Marjorie P. Hinckley Lecturer, 2018, Eric Carter. Thank you. So,